Antarctica, as large as the United States and Mexico combined. That's five million square miles of physiological desert, first sighted in 1820 by sealer Nathaniel Palmer, an American. And then again in 1823, James Waddell, the British sealer. Now, as our expedition started in 1939, September, as we are loading, as we loaded in Philadelphia and Boston with the two ships, the USS Bear of Oakland and the USS North Star, uh, which was the Department of Interior ship. Now, as, as we reveal our pictures here, uh, we have left uh, Philadelphia and Boston, and we are, in, we are now in Panama, where we, uh, we remained for two or three days to pick up all of our bamboo that we needed to, uh, uh, to uh, support all of our activities in the, in the Antarctic. Now, as we cross the equator, as you know, the, uh, anyone who has never been across the equator is called a polywog and has to be initiated through a regular ceremony of the royal, all the royal, the King Neptune, his royal queen and, and the royal babies and all, and they go through a regular ceremony uh, as they cross the equator and they, be they become shellbacks. Now, the ceremony was uh, quite an affair. All the crew members of the North Star who had never been south were all initiated, plus a lot of the uh, people there. Now, there's a, a, one little Eskimo that was on the crew of the North Star, which operated out of Seattle to Point Barrow, Alaska in the summertime. And he has never been no, no further south than Seattle, so it was quite a, a, an event for him. Now, as we went along, uh, all, of the, all of the expedition members were initiated, including myself, and uh, we all... Uh, Appreciated the, the the report that we are now becoming shellbacks, and then in future in future trips across the equator, we will be able to initiate the, the polywogs. And the, the temperature as we crossed the equator was in a mild uh, 75, between 75 and 80 degrees, and very and very nice, calm. The, the weather was uh, uh, the seas were right calm, and as we cruised along towards, uh, we were heading for the Pitcairn Island. That was going to be our first stop on the way. As we passed, we, uh, we passed the Galapagos Islands, uh, just just viewing them from from the sea as we as we went by. But our main uh, uh, stoppage was going to be at Pitkin Island. As you know, it was the island of the mutiny of the bounty when the uh, the bounty mutineers uh, rebelled against the, the captain of the, of the bounty, and they all went ashore and uh, they put the captain and his crew that were loyal to him in a rowboat. Which he finally made it all the way back to England and uh, to prosecute uh, uh, the, all the crew members of the bounty. Now, uh, the, the initiation, the initiation is still going on strong. And uh, all the, all the, now there's the royal, picture of the royal party. And uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the temperature was real, real nice. And that's Dr. Dr. Wade. He was our there's the ship's radio operator. And the, the final initiation would be in the ducking of the, of the water. Now, as we proceeded southwest across the Pacific, Pitcairn Island, a beautiful island, uh, it, uh, it had about 185 people. Yeah. They were all Seventh day Adventists. And uh, they lived, as you can see, the, the uh, the island itself. There's only one entrance into the island, and you have to come through the uh, uh, through the ice pad, uh, through the uh, uh, surf to get into it. And as you will see, uh, the entrance there, and the people that they keep they keep their boats uh, close to the edge, and they, they always pull them out of the water whenever they come in. Now, uh, there hadn't been a ship at uh, uh, at Pitkin Island in about in about six, seven months, due to the England England being at war and New Zealand is the protectorate for Pitcairn Island. Now you can see the, the old snow cruiser there, the big machine that was built in Chicago, and the tail section was made to come off because of its length, it was 85 feet long, and it had to come off so they could, so they could be transported aboard the ship. Uh, now Pitcairn Island uh, uh, has uh, uh, the people that were uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, very religious people, and all their names were either Christians, Adams, or uh, I think, uh, Total, uh, all of the population would either had a Christian or Adam name. And uh, you can see the the altitude now that we're above on top of the island. That's where they grew all their crops and everything, what they could, they could grow. And uh, as the 
as, as, as I said, that uh, Admiral Byrd gave them a lot of supplies because they had been uh, without anything during the war, uh, during, uh, during the, uh, the English uh, war over in Europe. And there's been no ships coming through Pitcairn, and that's, that's the only way that they get their supplies. Now, you see very mountainous, mountainous looking island, probably uh, volcanic, uh, volcanic origin. And, uh, but uh, it was real nice. Now, this is one of the Christian uh, uh, inhabitants. There, he's a, a direct descendant of, of Fletcher Christian. And uh, there's a little uh, a young uh, uh, lady. Her, her name is Adams. Now, you can see the view. Now, that's looking down into the surf where the entrance, uh, the, where they bring their boats in. And uh, the mutiny was supposed to have been sunk right out, not too far from the island there, so that the, uh, the British uh, fleet couldn't, couldn't pick them up when they were looking for them. Now, as we uh, progressed, uh, we were going to another island called Rapi Rapa Tahiti. It is the most, uh, the, uh, the outer island of all of the Tahitian group. And just like, uh, just like uh, the, the Pitkin Island, there hadn't been a ship in there in a long time. And as we pulled into their harbor, uh, we had to take soundings to make sure there's enough water there for us to come in. And we only spent the one day there. We got there in the morning and we left that, that evening. And uh, the, the island is governed by uh, a French Viscount. I think he was been exiled or some, some way or another and we put on this island here to, to uh, run it. And uh, not very many people, I think uh, about 150 population. And uh, very primitive. They're still living in grass shacks and everything, but the, the island itself is all volcanic. You can see the, the, the uh, origin of the, uh, the volcanoes uh, all around the whole island. And uh, you can see as we, as we approached there, the people were very friendly. And uh, they all spoke the, uh, the Polynesian and French. And uh, you can see that they greeted all of us as we came ashore just for, just for a visit. And our main stop was going to be uh, in Wellington, New Zealand. We had to stop in and pick up a, a lot of our supplies. And uh, you can see that's, that's, that was the, about the only brick building plus the church uh, of the whole island. And the rest of the people all lived in grass shacks. And uh, so they were, they were very, uh, they haven't had cigarettes in a long time, so we offered them cigarettes. And, uh, and you can see I'm giving them a, a nice cigarette there they have to enjoy themselves. Now there's Admiral Byrd uh, meeting with the French Viscount. That, that's the main street of the island. It's called Tahiti Rapa. And uh, this is the Viscount in the, in the brown jacket with Admiral Bird. And that's uh, myself and uh, Zaidi Collier, the other the marine engineer that was with us. And Admiral, Admiral Bird is always an aloof person, you know. He, he, likes to be, he likes to be by himself most of the time. And even aboard ship, he always had his meals by himself. And only on holidays that he would join the, uh, join the crew. But the, this beautiful island, and uh, you, can, you can see of all the, the, uh, the different vegetation and all that. And, uh, but uh, very, very remote. I mean, it was one of the uh, way, uh, uh, very farther south from, uh, from the, island, the main island of Tahiti. But uh, uh, they were very happy. We gave them also supplies and stuff that they needed, and uh, especially. Uh, there's no radio or anything on there, no electricity or anything on the island, so it, uh, I guess they use uh, lamps and stuff for, for, the, for the lighting. But uh, as we progress now, uh, that, that is the distance between the Pitcairn Island and Tahiti, and you can see the Tahitian group is way far north. Now, as we, as we cross the Pacific now, we're heading into Wellington, New Zealand. And aboard, we have about 85 dogs uh, on the board, the North Star, and the, the bear had another 85 uh, for, the, for the East Base, which uh, was going to be 1,700 miles east of Little America, uh, with uh, 26 people. And our base, with 33, was the largest of the two bases. And as we approach New Zealand, a beautiful island, uh, you, can, you can notice they're all the beautiful. Now, I happened to visit uh, two years ago, and the city of, of uh, Wellington had just about tripled in size and, and uh, population. And it's, to me, it's uh, New Zealand is one of the prettiest islands in all of the Pacific, barring none. And the people were so friendly. They're, they're typical, uh, more more like uh, 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 Englishmen than uh, uh, than New Zealand, but they uh, than Americans. Now Australia were more like Americans than uh, than uh, the New Zealanders were, and they were very uh, very religious people, and 
very, and very uh, accommodating and gave us plenty of supplies. And Admiral Byrd was very uh, welcome here because all of his expedition, this was one of his main stops, in the, and uh, this was his actually his third expedition. And uh, when he came through in 1929, the first time and, uh, uh, to fly over the South Pole, and then again in 1933, uh, which he uh, came and uh, a little exploration there. That's when he was he went out 100 miles and, and put up a little shed there, and uh, he, he wrote a book called Alone. But uh, he nearly died uh, due to the uh, gases that accumulated in inside of the shed when his uh, uh, when his flu had stopped up on him. Well, anyway, he was saved on brought back, and so this was our third expedition, and we're getting ready to leave uh, uh, leave Wellington and. Just 30 minutes before we left, um, uh, Dr. Seiple, one of our leading scientists, had met someone who was from my hometown, Birmingham, Alabama, and, uh, and she had uh, she went to the same school as I did. And uh, uh, we only talked for 30 minutes, but then World War II, when we, when the, we, uh, the Marines we all went into New Zealand and everything, uh, uh, we uh, continued our friendship, and uh, and they were wonderful people, and, uh, and they have visited us several times in the states. And uh, we were there two years ago in New Zealand and Australia to visit all of the friends that we, uh, we met uh, previously. Now, as we left New Zealand, we're on the way south, now due south. We're starting to pick up uh, uh, icebergs, but fortunately, as we went south, we were getting 24 hours of daylight because uh, it was the, actually the, the Antarctic summer in that, in that part of the, uh, of the universe. And, uh, luckily, uh, we could count all of the icebergs. Now they were uh, they were very large. Some of them as, as long as two and three miles long and half a mile wide, and other smaller ones. But they would drift on south until they finally would break up and uh, eventually would turn over uh, uh, in the water. And they were called castle birds then because of the of the pikes uh, uh, underneath the water. Now this is the old Bear of Oakland. Uh, she's our other ship. With the, uh, she had sails and diesel. Uh, I think her top speed was eight knots. And, uh, she rolled and rolled and rolled. We call her the roly-poly bear. But uh, she was uh, over 100 years old, and uh, she was a bark and had uh, quite a history in her. Now, there's the, there's the North Star uh, sailing along there, and uh, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're trying to get uh, down to where we go through the pack ice. We don't know how, how thick the pack ice is going to be, and we have to go through it. Now, the dogs were, were in very uh, good shape, uh, yeah, going through the tropics and everything, because most of these dogs came from New Hampshire and Alaska. They are Malamutes and uh, Huskies. Now, you can see, as we went down, we went into some really rough seas. They call the Roaring Forties, the, the Screaming Fifties, and the Howling Sixties. And at one time, we had to lean to because of the snow cruiser had uh, broken its chains and uh, was starting to uh, uh, move back and forth. Uh, with each roll and that alerted the whole crew and everybody had to get up and uh, we finally got it secured and, uh, and back in safe position. Now you can see off in the distance there uh, more of the, of the icebergs and as we went down they were getting more numerous and then we, we hit the pack ice as you'll see shortly and uh, you can see it, it's 90 feet above the water and nine tenths of that iceberg is underwater. And uh, they break off, they break off in the Antarctic of the ice barrier, the Ross barrier, and the pressure of the high altitudes of the Antarctic is pushing all of these ice out by the barrier, and they break off, and that's how they form the icebergs, and they drift north uh, into the warmer waters, where eventually they uh, uh, they melt down. But uh, uh, you, you will see in the and uh, and, and later on in the expedition where we used a big iceberg with two miles long and a half mile wide for a landing field. Uh, to rescue uh, our 26 men at the east base, which were they were uh, they were iced in. Now, uh, now here we are. We, we call this called the loose pack, and uh, it's all broken up and everything goes out. And uh, uh, we had uh, aboard uh, a Norwegian ice pilot who uh, uh, guided uh, ships all up north through all the ice packs. And uh, <coughs> the, the uh, American government uh, hired him to to help us going through the ice pack. And he watches the skies. You can see up ahead, uh, the black, uh, where there's open water, uh, the first penguins that we ran on one of the uh, one of the loose packs, and those are the little dailies. They're the small penguins that uh, live out, out in the open water most of the time. And as I said, the, uh, uh, the ice pilot watches the skies, and, and he steers for the darker areas in the sky. Now, wherever there's all white, uh, that's solid ice, and uh, uh, you don't dare go that way. And, uh, 
in later expeditions, some of the uh, fellows there, one of the planes there crashed because he went into the, he went uh, over land uh, uh, where it was uh, real white and there's no, no visibility. And they crashed into a big ice mountain and I think a few of them were killed. But that was the only pa uh, casualty they had and uh, that was in later, later, later on expedition. Now you can see down as the bow of the ship as, we're cu as we are cutting through the ice, the North Star is the ship that goes from Seattle up to Point Vera, Alaska, and makes two trips every summer. And a lot of times they have to break through the ice like that. So she was, uh, she had a steel bow that could go up and, uh, and, uh, and break through the ice. But they do ride up on it and then break it down. Just, but uh, we were uh, unlucky. We didn't have icebreakers. As uh, later expeditions, all were were supplied with the regular icebreakers, and uh, by the by the Coast Guard uh, operated. And uh, in fact. Uh, one later expedition could not get to the Antarctic without the help of the icebreakers to break up the ice uh, because they had 300 miles of ice. We were lucky. We only had 75 miles of it, and a lot of it was kind of, Once we got through the the, uh, the uh, pack ice, then we had open water all the way into the Antarctic, about 100 miles, which uh, is all free free of ice because most of the stuff all drifted north and, uh, and had open water. And you can see the size of the, the heights of that ice uh, and, and, and breaking off. Now we're coming in close to the pack ice. Now you can see uh, New Zealand off to the left there, and this, uh, uh, there's Little America, and there we're, we're, we're going through the pack ice. This is, this is still again uh, the, the loose pack, and the temperature at this time is around in the early, uh, down in the lower 30s, uh, between 35 and 37, and uh, I mean uh, 25 and 27, and then uh, 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 as we went closer, as we got closer into the Antarctic, though, we, the weather got down in the 20s. That's the summertime of the uh, Antarctic summers. And uh, uh, the average temperature of the summertime was uh, between 25 and 30 degrees. Uh, that was the average summertime. But the winter is something different. We had as low as 78 below at Little America, where we were stationed. But they have, they have registered temperatures near the pole itself uh, over, over, over 100 degrees uh, below zero. Now there's a lot of the sleds that we put together on the way down uh, to be used to carry all of our freight from the ships up to the uh, up to the uh, base of Little America. Now this uh, America, Little America, was actually the third American base. It was built on a flat ice where Admiral Byrd had uh, built his uh, in, uh, in down into a congested area, and uh, as, as we tried to go over to find. Uh, uh, we went down in the, in the old Little America of, 19, uh, of 1929 and 1933, and they were all crushed up by the ice. The pressure ice had just crushed them all up. But we managed to get down and get a few souvenirs from uh, Admiral Byrd's old, old uh, uh, place there. And, uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Seiple decided to put his base uh, at, uh, uh, on top of the Ross area, about three and a half miles from the Ross from the bay ice. But eventually, uh, that ice uh, moves out, and uh, they figured in about 10, maybe 15 or 20 years that maybe even Little America number number three will be gone. And all any any of the uh, future uh, uh, the future uh, uh, expedition, we had one in 19 uh, uh, in 19, seven, uh, 1970s, I think, and uh, uh, they had uh, eight airplanes, eight uh, DC-3s that they flew off of a carrier, and they, they left them there and. Unfortunately, the, uh, the ice moved out, and they're, they're probably all at the bottom of the sea now, because uh, they were too close to the edge. And Dr. Seiple tried to warn them that uh, uh, this admiral uh, 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 said, no, they will, we'll leave the base where it was. So it, as it turned out, they lost uh, the whole base. The whole base was gone. Because uh, when that, when that uh, ice moved out, it formed into an iceberg, and the way they went, and I imagine they're probably at the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Now, we're approaching, we're coming into Little America, and. Uh, uh, we found the, the bay ice itself is flat. It's only about eight to 10 foot thick. And uh, uh, that's why we did all of our unloading. And uh, we had to be careful because every once in a while the pressure underneath would break up the ice and the ships would have to pull out and wait till the ice uh, cleared and move back in. But we had to move it uh, all the way. We never, never kept any of the, the freight on the flat ice. We took it and, and hauled it up about a quarter of a mile up on top of the, uh, the, uh, the, Ross, the Ross shelf, which was about eight, nine hundred feet, above, I mean, uh, about uh, 90 feet above the water. And uh, therefore, it was, the, the, uh, it was solid ice up there. And that's why we built Little America number three. You can see now, and you see the height of that uh, from the ship alongside. We were, we were uh, 
edging down out to, to the Bay of Wales, it's called. Because all the time we were unloading, the, uh, uh, the whales all were played all around in the bay there. You could see them diving and coming up and roaring. Now this is the pack ice, this is the bay ice. As you can see now, we're getting ready to unload. And uh, as they pull up and we tie down, uh, putting all of our anchor on the, uh, the, dead, the dead anchors there to hold the ship. And uh, uh, always, here comes the old bear of Oakland there. She's uh, the old wooden ship there. And, uh, during one of the, one of the uh, few snowstorms that we had, usually it's a blizzard, but never never a little snowstorm like like, like it's going down now. But uh, I guess uh, near the water there, there's probably the, uh, uh, the moisture, of course, and the snowflake. Uh, and that's the Ross Bay area, runs 600 miles between Little America and all the way across into McMurdo, where we, uh, we now have an American base there. And there's the sleds all coming off now, getting ready to uh, load up all the uh, the freight coming off of the North Star and also over there. Now, and uh, all of our freight and stuff's coming off, uh, getting ready to load up. Now there's my little beach craft, uh, the one that I had picked up uh, at Wichita. That is the one that's supposed to ride on top of the snow cruiser. And we were supposed to go from Little America right to the South Pole. And I was supposed to do all the flying uh, uh, around the pole, around the South Pole itself, and uh, do all the mapping. And, uh, and as it turned out, uh, the, the big snow cruiser failed. It, uh, it just didn't have enough power. And, uh, and luckily, after seeing the territory that I was that the snow cruiser was, go, uh, was supposed to go, we, we, we never would have made it because of the uh, some of those crevasses were 100 feet across and bridged over. Uh, and uh, it didn't take much to uh, uh, to uh, break through and that's where we had there's a lot of the sharks playing around now that's the old Curtis Condor we had two of those uh, one at our base at, at, at Little America and the other one over at the East Base and we lost both of them uh, we never did bring uh, either one back uh, the one at Little America there just uh, uh, during our uh, latter part of our explorations there it lost an engine about 120 miles from Little America and uh, it was too late to uh, try to uh, take and, and uh, do a change engines and everything so we decided to leave uh, we, we uh, took all the instruments out and everything we just left it out there and we imagined it probably blew away uh, uh, tumbled up and probably covered with ice and there's the old cruiser there you can see we're getting ready to unload her and she was so heavy we had a bridge there she broke through the bridge that we built with steel uh, steel girders we only had uh, enough for half of the uh, the bridge but they made out we were, we were afraid that she was going to crash through the ice but but the ice held up pretty good, eight or 10 foot thick ice that uh, we loaded on. But the thing, it weighed 48 tons, so you can imagine. Now, it worked real good on the hard ice, but uh, you can see each motor had a 75 horsepower electric motor in it uh, in, on, the, on each wheel. And uh, you can see how far she sunk just on the flat ice. But after we got her up to the, uh, to the uh, high ice, up where the Little America, where the base was gonna be, she, uh, she kept sinking down and just bogged down, just didn't have enough power to, uh, to really get it up and rolling. And the only, we found the only thing that, that was actually would work was a tractor type of uh, uh, transportation. And uh, so I know in the future, all of the expeditions, all that's all they had, uh, everything was all tractor type. But, uh, 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 we had one tank that the Army, and we had a couple of Army boys with us that they brought the tank down for experimenting. And that's the one that they, uh, they found out that uh, that's the only type of transportation they could have. And there's a lot of seals there which was uh, uh, a main food supply for all of our dogs. And uh, we, we killed uh, th uh, 300 seals and, and put, th put them down in the, in, the, uh, in the tunnels there where the dogs were so we could feed them for the whole year. And uh, uh, well, each seal weighed, weighed anywhere from 12, 1,500 pounds. And, it, and uh, it, we had enough there to feed all the 85 dogs. And we'd give them a big, a big hunk of, uh, of uh, seal meat, which would uh, we have to chop it with an axe because once it's down, it froze up. Now, after we're doing all of our early operations there, we finally had to start securing for the winter. And we are building hangars now for the two planes. And we build them out of snow blocks, just like you'd build an igloo. And uh, we built it up and then put uh, our bamboo poles that we picked up in Panama across the top with canvas, and then the snow did the rest. And uh, three months later, when we uh, we tried to dig them out, now you can see the, uh, there's the two hangars. And, uh, we tried to dig them out, you'll see later. Now, as after we finished, everybody took a big hook of ice. That was for our uh, uh, mess hall. And we would throw it down, uh, our galley was underneath there, and that, that was our drinking water and all, all of our cooking water. And we had a regular area that we kept very clean so that we uh, would be no, uh, no pollution and everything. 
and there's no 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 germs at all in the Antarctic. Uh, we even uh, they even tried tried to pick up uh, pollen, and they had a, a, an Electrolux uh, uh, cleaner uh, with uh, uh, with filters to try to pick up any pollen. But uh, during the whole year, I don't think they picked up a single pollen. Or anything, so you can see how clear that we had no not a single uh, sickness all the time we were there. Now this is a little slight blizzard. Now we've got we've got plenty of those, and uh, it didn't take long for the blizzard there to cover everything up. So everything had to be marked with the, with the old bamboo poles that we picked up in Panama. And uh, now this is down in Dogtown, underneath the ice. And uh, each each uh, team had its own uh, uh, canal there. Uh, uh, and, and the only one that would go would be the, the driver of the of the trains. And he's the one that fed them, and he took care of them for the whole year. And uh, and the temperature usually in the winter ran around 35 to 40 below. And uh, but the dogs are. Uh, we're very used to cold weather. You can see they all stay there. They stay there the whole time. Once in a while, one of them will break out and do quite a few fights there, but, they, but the uh, drivers will get down and, and uh, separate them and get them, get them tied up again. Now, this is in our, our main building that we had. This is our living quarters, and uh, we, that's where we did all of our, uh, our meals and our sleeping. And uh, We had all stove. Uh, we had coal stoves. Uh, we brought a lot of coal down with us. There's our film projector, and we had movies. And, uh, all of our bunks there, uh, we had uh, two tiers. Now these are clothes drivers. We come from the outside covered with snow, so we, we shake them out and put our clothes on that and then pull them up to the ceiling where the warm air would dry, dry all of our clothes. Now this is in between the three buildings that we had. All of our supplies and everything was all stacked up there so it would be easily accessible to the, uh, uh, to the people. Now there's all of our movie films that we had. We got kind of tied up a little bit. Some of our movies went to the East Base, and some uh, and some of theirs went to our base. So, so after we got together, we had to talk to see what who, uh, how they made out. Now, this is some of the tests that we made with the with the old tank there, the Army tank. And uh, uh, during the winter, this is in the daytime in the winter, we had the, uh, total darkness, and we tried a lot of uh, uh, temperature. The temperature around there, around 58 to 60 below, and uh, they did a lot of uh, uh, experiments on the surface. And we sent out a party uh, to, to try out, uh, uh, to uh, observe the uh, Borea, uh, Borealis uh, Australis, the, the, the southern lights, as they call them. And this is our third building, the uh, machine shop, where we kept all of our uh, machines, our lathes, and uh, all of our working tools and stuff. And that, this is our washing machine to wash clothes. The only thing, uh, you had to bring ice in and, and uh, melt your water if you wanted to wash clothes to take a bath. Now, this is our, our science room, where all of the scientific uh, Experiments were being carried on, and uh, and uh, uh, of course a lot of us were guinea pigs. I know they uh, they did a lot of testing of us. Now, uh, as for myself, I came from uh, from the Virgin Islands, three years in Virgin Islands, and then went right to the South Pole. And they tested us uh, to see uh, about how how blood reacted. And uh, my blood took longer to freeze than some of the guys that were from Alaska and New Hampshire and Maine. So uh, so the old the old story of my blood thinned out is uh, a lot of baloney. But anyway, and, uh, this is Ike Schlossback, Commander Schlossback, who's an old Navy uh, aviator, retired. And he's been on, on every one of the Admiral Byrd's expeditions in the north and also in the south. And this was his uh, about fifth or sixth expedition. Now we're starting our spring exploration. We're getting ready to dig out all the airplanes. And, uh, and uh, this is down in the tunnel there. To, 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 uh, have to keep checking you and I had I had a, a way to get into it so I could check my plane make sure there's no damage or anything from the ice now, this is inside the snow cruiser four of us live there uh, dr. Wade uh, uh, was our scientist and uh, we had a radio operator and a, and a mechanic engineer a diesel engineer and myself as a pilot and uh, and uh, we, we are the ones who were supposed to take off with the snow cruiser and head south right to the pole and I'm supposed to do all the flying because they carried the plane on top of the uh, top of the cruiser but as I told you before it failed to, uh, failed to work out and uh, so we, uh, uh, we just had to use the, uh, the planes and uh, uh, doing exploration and uh, a lot of the flights that I made uh, with Dr. Seipel and Dr. Wade and, uh, and, uh, and our photographers we did a lot of mapping and uh, about 65 to 70 percent of that uh, the continent was unexplored at that time we were there and uh, as we, as we did a lot of our flights into the unknown, I spotted one, one mountain there that Dr. Seipel and I were mapping. And uh, I said, Dr. Seipel, I see a big one coming up at 11 o'clock. And he turned around and said, yep, it looked like it. I said, remember, I saw it first. So as it turned out, it was a 
12,500 foot mountain, which was uh, named after after my wife. Uh, it was named Mount Josephine Petrus. Now here we are digging the plains out. You can see the, how much snow had piled up during the three and a half months that they spent in uh, underneath the ice. And uh, there's very little damage though, because we were very careful and to get the snow off of it. And we used a tractor. We had uh, an, an international tractor, which is one of the uh, life savers of the whole expedition there, because it, it, it took uh, gas for us out 300 miles and to put up gas caches for us so, so we wouldn't have to come all the way back to the base to refuel. Now, you can see the, the old army tank that we uh, we took out and uh, they tested it and they put, uh, uh, wider, put wider treads on it. And it worked perfectly across all that. And that's what the cruiser should have had. And it probably would have worked, but I, in a way, I'm glad it didn't because after seeing the, like I told you, seeing all the country that we were supposed to go, we would have never made it. We would have probably fell in one of those big crevasses, and uh, they'd probably still be looking for us. Now, they, these boys here, they're the ones that took our gas out, and they, they, they picked themselves a little hut there so they wouldn't have to put up a tent every time they stopped for overnight, uh, I mean, to, to rest up. And we, and we gave the, the old snow cruiser the supreme test. We even put door wheels on it. And at 75 below, we gave it the supreme test, and it still broke through the through the crust of the ice and was uh, was bogged down. Now all the all the scientific parties are getting ready to go out for three months. Uh, uh, doing, they go up to the, all the the mountains that we had uh, discovered and to do all their testing and everything, and uh, uh, all the minerals and all types of uh, scientific uh, tests that they had to do geology and so forth and uh, they had the little bicycle wheel that was the counter uh, to tell how many miles they had gone and that's the old uh, the Curtis Condor and uh, she was uh, a very very nice plane but uh, only only had a speed of about 130 miles an hour and well, where the beach pack uh, cruised at 180. Anyway they, uh, uh, they did a lot of flying and uh, uh, we did a lot of mapping now you can see some of the from, from some of the planes there that uh, uh, all all that uh, these are taken from the flights and only the peaks of the mountains are taken up out of the, out of the snow and some of those mountains are uh, they run about eight nine ten thousand feet and you can imagine how much ice is, is below that uh, down into the uh, to the bottom of the ocean now the, now the South Pole itself is uh, is around between ten and eleven thousand feet above above sea level and that's where all of the pressure is coming down off of the off of the high. Uh, Mesa there, the plateau in Forster. Now you can see the pressure ice all building up there. Now this is uh, large ones. Uh, there's some of the country that we were supposed to go over to the, to the South Pole. You can see the pressure that built up and, and piles up the ice coming down off of that big high plateau of the, of the South Polar region. And uh, that's the ones that's forcing all the uh, ice out of the uh, Ross Barrier and break off and makes, makes the big, uh, uh, makes up the big iceberg. That Admiral Bird taking the uh, uh, soundings. All these mountains, and a lot of them are still unexplored. And uh, uh, of course, we have them all on that now. And I think up to now, I think they have about 80 or 90 percent of the Antarctic just about covered uh, with our big McMurdo, uh, McMurdo base over in uh, uh, 300 miles west of uh, the old America. And uh, uh, they're just about covered. Even they've even had uh, uh, people go all the way across with uh, uh, with dog teams all the way across the Antarctic. Now this is on top of one of the mountains there where uh, we supplied them with uh, by plane and we had to pick up uh, pick up the, uh, the specimens and everything and then give them their supplies. And the temperature is all around 30, 35 below uh, all the time we were uh, in up there. So we didn't delay too long, we just, uh, it was quite uh, high winds there. Anyway, uh, we'd give them their stuff and then we'd, we'd take off and come on back and uh, go to another base and give, give uh, uh, now here comes one of our old, old tank hauling all this, our supplies again. And uh, that, that was one of the best pieces of equipment that we had. Now we're getting the end of our, uh, all of our uh, flight exploration and everything and, and uh, getting time to go home. But we had to go over to pick up the other 26 men who were 1,700 miles away. But before that, three of us, uh, my, my two mechanics there, uh, my airplane mechanic and my diesel engineer, decided to go fishing down. We, we heard there was some cracks in the ice. And this is what we found, 170 emperor penguins uh, all grouped around, uh, I guess waiting to, uh, to go north. I don't know, they, they probably just came in to rest up. And we sat, luckily I had my camera, movie camera with me, 16 millimeter, only black and white. And I sat in the center of them, taking all of these pictures. And they would come up and talk to me as if I was another type of penguin. And uh, after, after about an hour or so, we decided to try and take them back to the fishing was out. 
because our lines would freeze up before we could even try to even pull them out of the water. And so we decided to herd them, and uh, we rounded them up, and it took us it took us nearly seven to eight hours to to get them up to the Little America, uh, about three miles away. And uh, by the time we got there, we only had 37 left. The rest were scattered, you know, and, and we couldn't chase them. Anyway, we, we ended up with 37 live ones in Little America, and uh, we put them in a compound. Now here, they, here they're supposed to be making love or something. I don't know. They, uh, now they say no, no, so they go away. And uh, he goes around till he finds somebody else that, that they will sit there and go. Uh, and uh, these two evidently making out because they're not saying no. And uh, they're probably uh, picking their mates. But. Uh, uh, the, the emperor is the only penguin that stays on the Antarctic continent the whole winter. They, 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 uh, they go into their rookery there and they have they lay their egg and they, they uh, during the whole winter and they stay up. But they have enough fat on them to last them for the whole winter. And uh, they're the only ones that, uh, uh, that that remain on the continent. And uh, finally, eventually, uh, when the summer comes, they go north and breed and come back. Now, uh, we called the uh, we called the Smithsonian Institute. Told them what are we going to do? We have 37 live penguins with no food for them. And they said, and they said well, the only thing is that uh, you'll we'll have to kill them, put them on ice, and uh, we'll pick them up when you come back, and uh, we'll, we'll fix up a, uh, a South Pole display at the Smithsonian, which they did. And we brought them all back, and the Smithsonian picked them up. But it was quite a feat, though. Doctor Doctor Frazier, uh, surgeon, he showed us how. It took four of us. To, uh, kill each one, but we had to be real careful not to not to tear the skin of them. And so he showed us exactly what to do, and it, it took us about three or four hours to kill all 37 of them. Anyway, they, they, uh, uh, some of them, uh, uh, we had a couple there that we, uh, we tried to eat the meat, but they were very, very fishy, and uh, so we didn't catch this, especially with seal meat. They, uh, they tried to uh, feed us seal meat one day a week to try to help on the food supply, but uh, that's the day that uh, I tried it one time, but uh, I just couldn't stomach the uh, fishy taste of the seal meat, so I would have scrambled eggs on that day. Now, this is at the top of Little America. These, these are the 37 that we finally herded up. And, uh, <laughs> see, they're very, you can see they, how they try to hit you with their flipper. They weigh, uh, they weigh about 85 pounds, and uh, they run three to three and a half feet tall. And uh, that's when we uh, get ready to put them in the compound. Now here comes, uh, th we're getting ready to go home now. Uh, it's time to pack up, uh, and go over to uh, try to pick up our other uh, 26 crew men over at the East Bay, 1,700 miles away. And uh, uh, we, we start loading up, and uh, we tried to get a few uh, uh, seals and, uh, and uh, penguins to, to bring home, but uh, uh, they, they were very scarce at that time. As the North Star came in and brought us all a lot of mail and stuff, and, uh, and there's our, the, 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 uh, the greeting, the, the greeting committee, always there whenever they come in, a little of daily payment. Now, uh, all of the dogs that we had, we brought home 85 dogs, but uh, uh, we, uh, I'll tell you later that when we tried to break, break the other 26 men out 1,700 miles away, uh, we had 300 miles between us and the base. We could not get in there to take them out. So we had to fly them out with the only last condor we had. And that's when we found this big iceberg. It was two miles long and a half mile wide. And we used it for a landing field for the uh, for the crewmen. Now here we are trying to pick up a few a few seals. But uh, they, they never uh, made out because they wouldn't eat anything. And we finally had to, uh, to dump them out. Uh, the dogs, they had uh, they, uh, uh, were, were a problem. They don't know what should we do. Well, you can't leave them. We can't leave them. So anyway, the, the plane came up and flew uh, half of the crew on this island, and then went back. And, uh, and I'll tell you later that they set up uh, uh, all the explosives they had and put all the dogs they had on this one big platform, and they set a time bomb to go off about uh, four hours after they took off. It was only about an hour and a half, two hour flight to the uh, to the island. And they would, in case the weather closed in, they couldn't get back, and they'd have to go back. Now, this is a sea leopard, one of the uh, dangers of the Antarctic. They're, they're, they feed on seals and penguins, and uh, they're very large. They weigh about uh, 1,500, 2,000 pounds. They're about 10 to 12 feet long, and they, they have uh, a mouth just like a big snake uh, with teeth on it. And that's where they, they, they can go underneath the ice and try to dump it to dump a seal over, and they, they'll come up and grab seals off of the ice. Now, that's, now, this is when we got ready to come out, 
we had to come out to the Antarctic Circle and then, and then go all the way around the Antarctic Circle to, as we come around like this. We had to stay there all the way around 1,700 miles uh, to our other base, which is below South America. That's part of the Antarctic, which, uh, as I told you, it was as large as the United States and Mexico combined. Anyway, as, as we came around the Antarctic Circle and uh, below South America, and we went into our, we tried to get into our base there, and I told you that we had 300 miles of ice into the base. And uh, we couldn't, we waited for 30 days. And finally, the ice was getting bad, uh, getting ready to even close us up. So they told, well, you can, you can see the area of the Antarctic. Now, this is... Uh, We, that's when we decided to fly the, uh, uh, the people out. We used the one condor left, and uh, they brought, as I told you, we brought the, uh, half of the crew, and they went back to set the bomb up for the dog. And I'm telling you, there was a sad bunch of boys when that last uh, flight came in with, with the rest of the crew. And we had to leave the plane on top of the iceberg. We couldn't get it down because it was 90 feet above and no way to, to, uh, to save the plane. So they had to leave it, and uh, eventually, I imagine, it's on the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Now, here's a few of the things that we found that... Uh, now, these little Gintu penguins have a little tuft uh, uh, on each side. There's quite a, uh, uh, quite a few uh, species of penguins that, uh, that, that uh, are listed. But of all, the emperor is the largest of all the emperor of uh, the penguins. Uh, you can see the beautiful color. They have the pink color, I mean the orange color, the orange and the white and black. But they're, uh, but they're very gentle. I mean, they, uh, if you don't bother them, they'll come right up to you and talk to you. And, uh, uh, some of the other things. The, uh, a lot of the zoos now have penguins that they get off of South America called uh, rock hoppers, and uh, uh, that's why you see a lot of it. And uh, some uh, some of the zoos now have uh, some of the emperors now. They have the, the first bunch that we, uh, they, they tried to uh, bring back that didn't live very long in the, in uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, quarters that they had, you know, with the ice mills. But they, they lived maybe one two years, and they would all die out. But now I understand in San Diego they have quite a quite a, a, a big display of emperors and all types of penguins and they have the the uh, the, uh, the area that they have is just similar to the ones in the Antarctic so they uh, the temperatures and so forth and this this is some of the pool that we tried to bring back uh, we picked up a little, little pool for the penguins and, but uh, they wouldn't feed we couldn't feed them so uh, eventually uh, some around the little died and this is why we were waiting for 30 days uh, in the area about uh, 300 miles from Little America, and, and this time we tried to lasso a uh, uh, sea leopard, and uh, which it turned out to be a mistake. Now this is on, on the bear, on, on the bear of open uh, We're waiting, waiting, and waiting, and then finally, that's when they flew the people over. But uh, I tell you, it got so bad that we thought we were going to be snowed in, and we'd be stuck for another year. <coughs> As it turned out, we luckily, uh, after we got the crew out of the, uh, out of the now this is Admiral Byrd's uh, seaplane that he took down with him just uh, on the way down, and he took it right back to the States. He didn't leave it down there. And uh, it, it's called a Barclay Crow. I don't think it was a very man, more, mostly an experimental airplane. <coughs> now this, uh, uh, our East Bay was real mountainous there. They had a lot of mountains, and, uh, and but the weather there was a lot warmer than the Antarctic, uh, but they had higher winds. Oh, they had uh, gale winds up to 70, 80, 90 miles an hour sometimes. And uh, that's where all the whalers uh, would, would uh, go in and pick up their fresh water uh, from the top of the mountain lakes, you know, and stuff. They run hoses down. And this is another sea leopard. Uh, we try, we try, we, we, that's the one we had lassoed. <laughs> we finally had to let him go. Look at those teeth, uh, the size of them. Imagine that trying, uh, trying to uh, get after you. And, uh, but uh, we killed about six or seven of them to try. There's one getting uh, just looking at you, I mean, uh, uh, with, with the evil eye. Now, uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful settings there at, at, uh, at our east base, uh, with all the high mountains there with the snow covers on them and everything. And finally, uh, uh, we, we finally had to get out of there and we, uh, after we rescued all the guys from the... Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the Spanish expedition went through there, uh, from uh, from South America, uh, about seven eight years later, and they found no trace of the dogs that uh, uh, that they had put uh, uh, under the on, uh, on top of the explosives there to kill them, to put them away. So they couldn't leave them there because they would kill each other. There's no food for them, 
and uh, where they were, and uh, eventually they would all die. So the, the most humane thing to do was to kill them. So here we go, getting ready to come home, and, and the starting store. We put the little beach craft away, and we thought we might have to use it to go after the after the people. But uh, luckily, there was no place uh, lower than 90 feet that we could get on and get to. So that's why that's why we had to leave the the. Uh, the Curtis Condo on top of the big iceberg. We luckily finally just barely got out of there with all that ice moving in and uh, it was an anxious moment for about 24 hours of us uh, breaking through all this ice trying to get out of there before we got blocked in. And we finally we finally got into Punta Arena Silly. Uh, that's why we, we, both the ships we both met there and uh, and uh, a lot of the crew, one ship was gonna go to the east coast and one to the west coast, so uh, we parted company there. And the bear I was on the bear coming to Boston, and uh, she was an old ship. It used to be a coal, a coal uh, 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 treated by coal. And anyway, uh, a lot of the dust was still in that. And we all walked around with uh, coal dust all over us. We were lucky when we got home to take a good clean bed. But, uh, but as we came in, we stopped. We made two stops in Rio and in, uh, in Buenos Aires for a couple of days, and then to Rio Jean de Janeiro for two days. And we finally eventually wound up in Boston. Uh, I'm a bird, but I can't. And uh, as if as if he had been uh, 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 with the expedition the whole time. That that said, I hope you all enjoyed it, and uh, be glad to show it again.